Hi guys, welcome back to Third Term. My name is Amelia and I'm a first year psychology, clinical and cognitive neuroscience student. I just wanted to welcome you to the meeting today, whether you've been watching CU for the entirety of the year or it's your first time, you're so welcome to join us today. Our session today, we will be introducing our new series called In The Waiting and we will be exploring how to have faith whilst we're in the waiting season. And this will be delivered by Simon Pethick from Duke Street Church. And I'm just gonna take a minute to pray for Simon today. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just wanna thank you that Simon's gonna deliver this wonderful preach to us today. I just pray that you will bless him and that his words will be received on open ears, Lord. Thank you for your blessings on us, uh, amen. Hi, uh, good evening. Hello to Royal Holloway CU. Uh, great to be sort of with you this evening. I'd love to be there in person at meeting all together, but this will have to do. Uh, my name is Simon. I'm one of the pastor's ministers at Duke Street Church. And I'm really glad to be thinking through with you this evening, uh, waiting in faith or faith in waiting. What does it look like to have faith while we wait in the Christian life? Now, the classic text in the Bible on faith is Hebrews 11. And so we're going to read uh, a few highlights from Hebrews 11 together. It will really help you to have a Bible. So uh, grab a Bible, whether paper or, or digital or whatever. Uh, and we're going to read just a few snippets from Hebrews 11. I'll give you a moment to turn it up um, so that you can check that what I'm saying really is what the Bible says. Hebrews 11. And we're going to read, first of all, a definition of faith there in Hebrews 11, verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We'll have a think about that uh, a little bit later on. Now, flick over uh, to, uh, to uh, verse 8 with me. And we get a case study of faith in action. Verse 8. By faith... Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself, that's his wife, received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, he's really old, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These, that is, now all of the people listed in this great portrait gallery of faith, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they'd been thinking of that land from which they'd gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And then the whole of chapter 11 all leads up to this great crescendo in chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, and the Lord Jesus. Let's read at 12, 1 to 3 together. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, including Abram and Sarah and many others, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now this is God's word, so we need his help to understand. Let's briefly pray before we dive in together. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the clarity of it. We pray that you'd help us to clearly understand what you're saying to us here. Teach us what it looks like to wait in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So what is it that you're waiting for at the moment? Uh, maybe it's the end of COVID. I think we're all waiting for that, aren't we? Uh, the, the 17th of May, maybe, when you can sit inside the pub with uh, with your friends in the warm instead of freezing your face off in the beer garden or or june 21st even better when all the restrictions will end 
allegedly. Or maybe it's something else completely, uh, waiting to hear what uni life will look like from September, or, or waiting for exam results, or the outcome of a job interview maybe for you final years. Life is filled with waiting. And so is the Bible. The, the Bible is a wonderfully realistic book, have you noticed that? It, it describes life as it really is, not necessarily as we might wish it was. It's life with all of its anxiety and stress, uh, uncertainty and delay, with all of life's waiting and hoping. And Hebrews 11, where we're going to spend our time together for the next few minutes, is a chapter filled with waiting. It's a portrait gallery of Christians from the past who teach us what it looks like to wait and with faith. And the chapter begins in verse 1 by telling us what faith is. So let's answer that question first together, what faith is. So there we go, what is faith? Uh, your friend says to you, oh, do you know, I wish I had your faith. What do they mean by that? Is it a, a sort of magical ability to believe something without any evidence? Maybe it's a sort of spiritual gullibility. I think it's so amazing, it's so commendable how you, you'll just believe anything. Uh, like the queen in Alice in Wonderland, you remember, who tells Alice, uh, why sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Is that it? Is it the ability to believe impossible things? Well, look at the definition we're given there in chapter 11, verse 1. Have a look down with me at your Bible, 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Notice those two words there used, if you like, as synonyms for faith, assurance and conviction. Uh, some translations use the word confident there, confidence. Uh, so faith is simply being sure or confident about something, which means that faith isn't uh, some magical ability some people have. It, faith, uh, broadly defined, is something all of us have and all of us exercise and use all the time. Every person you've ever met is in one sense a person of faith because they all put trust and confidence in uh, things or people every day of their life. That biting into a sandwich is an act of faith that it's not going to poison you. Uh, sitting down on the chair you're sitting on is an act of faith, faith that it's not going to break or buckle. We put our faith in people. Uh, we, we weigh them up, we watch their behavior, maybe subconsciously, and we decide whether or not they're the sort of person we can trust. Maybe decide whether we want to be friends with them. You don't have to be a Christian to have faith in someone or something. Uh, if you decide that there is no God, that's a faith position. Now, uh, an atheist listening to that might object, uh, but it's based on evidence. Well, yeah, but, but faith is always based on evidence. Uh, evidence that the, the sandwich is good for you, or not going to kill you at least, uh, evidence that the, the chair is stable, uh, evidence that the person you're befriending won't stab you in the back when you're not looking. We, we might subconsciously weigh up the evidence, but that's what we're doing. In the Bible, faith is always driven by evidence. Uh, think of those old, uh, the old, those old steam engines. If faith is the carriage, evidence is the engine at the front pulling it along. When someone becomes a Christian, they aren't moving from having no faith to having faith all of a sudden. They're just changing where they're putting their faith, and they make that decision based on evidence. Where Christians learn to put their faith increasingly as they go through the Christian life is in the promises of God. Faith is confidence in the promises of God. Which brings us to the granddaddy of faith here in Hebrews 11, Abraham. First Abraham and then later Abraham. You talk to any uh, Old Testament or New Testament Jew about faith and then immediately think of Abraham. Uh, do you remember uh, how his story started back in Genesis 12? Uh, God appeared to him out of the blue and, and made him a string of promises. Uh, I'll read it for you, no need to turn there. This is Genesis 12 though. Uh, God said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
Did you notice? That is a string of big, big promises. A promise, for example, of a massive family, enough descendants to form a new nation, as numerous as the sand on the seashore or the stars in the sky. And a new land in, in, in which uh, that nation will live, a promised land. And then a promise of blessing and protection from God wherever Abraham and his family go. Uh, Abraham marries Sarah, and so now these promises are for her too. And, uh, and she'll, of course, have a big role to play, particularly in the family aspect of the promise, in the descendants bit. And Abraham becomes the father of faith in the Bible because he believed those promises God had made to him. Look at verse 9, nine of chapter 11, 11 verse 9. By faith, Abraham went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. And Sarah, his wife, became the mother of faith alongside him because she too trusted God's promises. Have a look at verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. They both came to the conclusion based on the evidence that when God made a promise, he could be trusted. This is the essence of biblical faith, confidence in the promises of God. And that's what being a Christian is. It's coming to the conclusion based on the evidence that God can be trusted and that I can be confident that he will keep his promises. And the Bible contains the most amazing promises. For example, God promises that when I put my trust in the Lord Jesus, he will forgive me everything I've ever done wrong and welcome me into his family, loving me unconditionally without end. God promises me that when I put my trust in Jesus, he's able to work all things together for my good. And no matter how easy or hard my life is or how wise or foolish I am, God promises that he'll never leave me or forsake me. He'll never reject me or kick me out of his family for bad behavior. God promises that I have the most amazing future with him, even beyond death, a future will, which will never get boring or old and never run out. We'll think about that one in particular later on. And what evidence is there that God will keep his promise? Well, God has kept the biggest promise of all. He's kept his promise to send his son, even to death on the cross, for the sake of people like you and me so that we could be forgiven and befriended. If God has even done that, we know we can trust him on every other promise he's made. Faith in the waiting means trusting in the promises of God. Of course, we can't trust promises we don't know. And that's why, isn't it, one of the reasons we study the Bible together. We love to dig in the Bible to hear the promises of God and to build our lives upon them. Faith is confidence in the promises of God. So that's what faith is. Let's uh, ask a second question though. What does faith do? Let's see together what faith does. What faith does. If you'd, uh, if you'd lived at the right time and met Abram and Sarah, how would you know that they believed God's promises? Did they have a, a, a halo over their head or a, a holy gl glow or a sort of spiritual unflappable zen about them in every situation? No, their faith produced obedience. Let's see that with me in verse 8 of chapter 11. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. This is crazy behavior, isn't it? He has no idea where this land is or really what it's like. It's a land he's never seen before. He can't research it online. He can't Google it, look at Google images of where he's going. He has to uproot his whole family, leave behind everything and everyone he's known and loved, and travel who knows how far to be he doesn't know where. And remember the uncertainty that you felt maybe when you moved to university. New course, new city, new people. Or maybe you didn't move and, uh, because you're a refresher and, uh, and it was all online. And you, you had the, the new uncertainty of what uni life online would be like. Well, take that uncertainty and then multiply it and multiply it and you have Abram here. 
This is crazy obedience. So why does he do it? Why does he go anyway, anyway in obedience to this command? Because he trusts God's promises. He's seen enough about God to know that he can trust him, he can believe him, and so he obeys. Faith in God's promises and obedience to God's commands come as a pair, they come together. You'll never find one without the other. You'll never find true faith that doesn't obey God in some way. And you'll never find true obedience to God that isn't being powered by faith in God's promises. They come together. Let me steal an illustration I heard, and I'll adapt it a little bit for the, our purposes this evening. I, imagine you're watching a dancer. Uh, they've got uh, headphones on, uh, listening to music, and they're moving to the music in the most elegant, beautiful way for hours and hours and hours and hours without stopping. And you watch them, you admire them, and you think to yourself, I'd love to dance like that. So you study their moves, and you begin to imitate them. You begin to dance, copying the dancer. But after about 15 minutes, you start to feel a bit stupid. The moves are awkward, they feel random, the whole thing feels pointless, it makes no sense, and so you soon give up. And what's the problem? What's missing? Well, the music's missing. You can't hear the music, it doesn't make any sense without the music. It's the music that produces the dance moves. And it's faith in God's promises which produces obedience to God's commands. It's the belief which leads to the behavior. Abraham hears and believes the promises of God, and as it were, he dances his way to the promised land. Faith in the waiting looks like obedience. Okay, but what does that look like for us? Well, God isn't calling us to move countries, as with Abraham, not in the same way anyway. But he is calling us to live for Jesus and speak for Jesus where we are right now. Whether it's uh, uh, back on campus, whether it's at home with parents, obeying Christ in person, obey obeying Christ online, whether we've got years of uni still to go or we're on the scary precipice of post-university life and all the uncertainty that comes with it, faith in the promises of God leads to obedience, taking him at his word and obeying his commands. So we've seen what faith is. It's confidence in the promises of God. We've seen what faith does. It obeys God, it believes him, and it obeys him. Finally, let's see together where faith looks, where faith looks. So, uh, Abraham makes it all the way to Canaan, land of Canaan, the promised land, and there he does something very strange. Now, imagine you've graduated, you've got your dream job in your dream city, wherever that is. Let's say for the sake of uh, argument that it's uh, Sydney, not a bad place to be, great coffee, uh, perfect weather, perfect beaches, and you've got a, a great job there too. But instead of buying or renting a place there in Sydney in the city to live, instead you put up a tent in the local park and you live in that tent for the rest of your stay. That's Abram. Verse 9, have a look. Verse 9. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Why was Abraham living in tents and treating the promised land like a foreign country instead of as his new home? Why is he living as though he's just passing through? Well, the answer's there in verse 10. For, verse 10, he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Now, the word looking there could be translated waiting. Somehow, Abraham knew that God's promise of a new home would be fulfilled somewhere better than Canaan. Uh, Canaan was just a picture, it was a sort of uh, photograph of another country to come. And Abraham's entire stay in the promised land was spent waiting for that great city to come in the future. A city, verse 10, designed and built by God himself. 
And it wasn't just Abram waiting for this city either. Verse 13 there tells us that all of these people in Hebrews 11, all of these heroes of faith, lived as strangers and exiles on the earth. That is, they lived as though they didn't finally belong on the earth because, verse 16, they were waiting for a better country. That is a heavenly one. And this is what every Christian has uh, ever since has been waiting for. The whole of the Christian life, in one sense, is spent waiting for the grand reveal of the promises of God. The moment someone becomes a Christian, they begin to wait. An active, obedient waiting for the return of Christ and the heavenly city to come. A new city, a new country to come, better than any city or country you've ever visited. One of the, the frustrations of the pandemic, the lockdown, has been our inability to travel, hasn't it? Uh, we can't see the world, visit amazing places. We have to settle for documentaries on Netflix or whatever. Look, let me tell you, if you never get to travel the world and see that country or city you so long to see, it's going to be okay if you're a Christian. Because God is preparing for his people, he's preparing for you as you trust in Christ, a city, a country far better than any city or country you could visit here and now. A heavenly one, verse 16. That doesn't mean a sort of floaty city, you know, with chubby angels playing harps on clouds. This city will be as physical as the chair on which you're sitting. It'll be heavenly, though, because God will be there. God, the source of all humanity's joy, all of our peace and hope, God will be with there, with them there. And the Bible finishes with uh, the most amazing description of a garden city. It's a, a garden like the Garden of Eden. A perfect, sinless, painless, joyful, abundant, exciting, uh, but more than Eden, Eden 2.0, a garden city where God dwells with his people. No COVID, no lockdown, no sickness, no disappointment, no depression, no death. It's the city everybody is homesick for, deep down. It's why Christians never feel like they fully belong here in this world. This is where faith looks. Faith in the waiting looks to the future and to the heavenly city to come, where Christ is. And where every promise God has made to his people comes true. And all of the waiting, however painful, proves to be worthwhile. And this is ultimately what Christians are waiting for. Not the end of COVID, not the end of uni or anything else, but the day we get to go home and live in the promised city. And someone has said somewhere that 99% of the benefits of following Jesus are yet to come there in that city. It's for that city we wait. And in our waiting, we have the perfect example to follow. An even better example than Abraham, the ultimate man of faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read about him briefly there in chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. You saw how he was described in verse 2. The founder and perfecter, or the, the founder and the finisher of our faith. I think about it. Remember how he faced the ultimate trial, death on the cross, under the judgment of his father. Imagine the anguish and the uncertainty of it, greater even than Abram's uncertainty as he went to a country he'd never seen. He endured the ultimate waiting, waiting for trusting in his father to raise him from the dead and vindicate him. And what was it that kept him going? What kept him obedient under such intense pain and pressure? How did Christ endure the cross? Verse, verse 2, for the joy that was set before him. The joy promised him in the future with his father. He trusted God's promises about the future and that coming joy, and he obeyed even to death. And now we're told he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The Lord Jesus has blazed the trail for you and me to follow. We have, like him, great joy set before us in the heavenly city to come. We may well have to endure pain and sorrow while we wait. And the waiting may go on who knows how long. 
But we wait together with the promises of God in our hearts, with our eyes fixed on that future heavenly city to come, knowing that when it arrives with Christ, all the waiting, all the homesickness and all the heartache will be so thoroughly worth it. So in our waiting, let's turn the music up. Let's fill our lives with those wonderful promises from God. And let's long with Abraham for that better country and for home. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these wonderful examples of faith, men and women who endured great trouble and long wait, and who even when they died hadn't yet received uh, the great fulfillment of all of your promises. We thank you that we will receive that promise with them when Christ returns and we're welcomed home to your heavenly city. We pray that you'd help us in the meantime to wait with faith. We pray that our faith in your promises would lead to obedience in everything we think, do, and say. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Simon, um, for that really, really encouraging word. Um, yeah, we just want to kind of um, gather together and worship in response to what we've just heard. Um, so yeah, why don't you join me and us um, yeah, as we worship.
introduce a new song um, that basically just like declares like God's faithfulness in every single situation um, and how that his promises um, the things that he promises us always end in yes and amen um, I think it's just a really good song just to declare like God's sovereignty over everything in our life um, yeah so let's just sing this Father of kindness. Oh 
of the message that Simon brought to us this evening. I thank you so much that you are a God who is faithful in our waiting. I thank you so much that you have provided us um, with so much that we can be confident in, that your promises are yes and amen. How amazing you are, Lord. We are so thankful for that. I just pray that as we head into another week, we'll be able to fix our eyes on you and just remember how faithful you are and take our confidence from that. Pray this all in your good and perfect name. Amen. Amen. Hi everyone, just want to quickly um, chime in here and, and remind everyone to come to prayer um, on Monday morning at 9am. We meet on Zoom um, and we're meeting 45 minutes later than usual, um, which is a bonus. But yeah, just a fabulous way um, to start the week with God um, as we pray together. Um, yeah, and we give all these assignments and um, three to God. Um, yeah, so please feel free to join us this Monday at 9am. Um, yeah, we hope to see you there.